תודה רבה לדוקטור רון מלכה, מנכ"ל משרד הכלכלה והתעשייה, ועכשיו אנחנו רוצים לכנס ביחד, במיוחד, את שגרירי ארצות הברית, צרפת ואיחוד האמירויות לשיחה על האתגרים שמציב העידן החדש ואיך העולם יבסס יציבות כלכלית תחת המשבר וגם על ההזדמנויות החדשות שנפתחות ביחסים הבינלאומיים עם ישראל ואני שמחה להזמין את מר אבירם סושארד, מנכ"ל פיליפס אלקטרוניקס ויושב ראש ועדת סחר חוץ בהתאחדות התעשיינים להנחות את הפאנל הבא העידן החדש מציב בפנינו אתגרים חדשים ושינויים מהותיים בכלכלות העולם. אנו צופים בהתמודדותן של אירופה וארצות הברית עם תוצאותיו של משבר הקורונה, הן בפן הבריאותי והן בפן הכלכלי. בשנה זו נחתמו גם הסכמי אברהם במזרח התיכון, אשר להם השלכות רבות על מדינת ישראל. כיצד מתכונן העולם לבסס יציבות כלכלית תחת משבר, ואילו הזדמנויות חדשות נפתחות ביחסים הבינלאומיים עם ישראל? כיצד ייראה העידן החדש של כלכלת ארצות הברית? כיצד ישפיע הברקסיט על האיחוד האירופי? מה יהיו ההשלכות של הסכמי אברהם על המזרח התיכון? ומה השפעתה של סין בכלכלה העולמית בכלל ובמזרח התיכון בפרט? So, uh, good evening. Uh, the session will, uh, will be conducted in English. The global COVID crisis uh, also led to significant changes in the world of economy. What changes will the new US era led by President Biden promote? How will the Green Deal affect Europe? And what implications will the Abraham Accords have to the Middle East? US, French, and UAE ambassadors gather now to discuss the challenges posted posed by this new era. The world is establishing economic stability under crisis, while new opportunities emerged and opening in international relations with Israel. I am deeply honored to welcome our distinguished guests. His Excellency, Ambassador Thomas Nides, His Excellency, Ambassador Eric Danon, who will be joining us via Zoom, His Excellency, Ambassador Muhammad El Raja, Advocate Ayelet Nachmias Ferbin, Chairperson of the Israeli Expert Institute, and Mr. Adiv Baruch, Departing Chairman, Israel Expert Institute. Please join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. First question to His Excellency Ambassador Thomas Nides. Good evening and thank you uh, for joining us. The uh, Biden administration has committed further advancing of the Abraham Accords and it is rumored that Indonesia and Saudi Arabia are considering normalizing relations with Israel. How is the Biden administration going to increase Israeli normalization with Muslim majority nations? Well, um, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, for, well, first of all, uh, thank you all very much for having me, and I'm honored uh, to, be, uh, to be participating. Uh, obviously, I don't think any of us would prefer, would prefer to be sitting at home. I think all of us would like to be there with you live, but uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID has created the scenario for all of us. I, uh, but I'm honored to hear. I've, I've been the, the ambassador for about six weeks, uh, so I'm uh, the, one of the newest of the, of the bunch here. Uh, but I want to make a couple of quick uh, intro comments. Uh, number one, um, I'm honored to be on the stage uh, with my friend uh, Mohammed from the UAE. And obviously, Eric, you and I don't really know each other. I've spent a lot of time with Mohammed. But I will be clear, uh, the, the Abraham Accords would not have happened without the leadership of the Emiratis. Um, and um, uh, one of the people who uh, was very instrumental in all this was obviously Yusa. Ataba, who is actually uh, the UAE ambassador to the United States uh, and is a good friend of Mohammed's and very important to the government. But I just want to recognize uh, the importance of the Emiratis have played uh, in, this, uh, in this journey. Uh, number two, um, when I was confirmed just uh, a few weeks ago in the United States and was testifying in the U.S. Senate, for my confirmation, I made it very clear that the Biden administration is fully and completely committed to the Abraham Accords. Yes, the Abraham Accords, uh, and are focused on uh, in, in increasing the involvement of the countries that have currently signed on. 
I emphasize that because uh, one of the things um, I like to do is having spent half my career in business and half my career in government is to get stuff done. And I think um, the focus on the countries that are currently have quote signed on, including uh, Egypt and Jordan, I think it's imperative that all of us folks focus on doing more transactions, more deals, more opportunities with those countries right now. And I feel like that is my job uh, to deal with my uh, with my friends uh, in the Abraham Accords. Uh, in fact, um, uh, at the end of this month, uh, I will be hosting uh, the first meeting of, that I've hosted with all the ambassadors of the Abraham Accords, uh, which I'll hope be hosting. And I think uh, probably hopefully the following month, Muhammad will be hosting to continue digging into these, uh, what we can do bilaterally and trilaterally uh, and making sure that these are real uh, transactions. And I think one of the real goals here is to make the people, the people exchanges, the business transactions and really solidify this for the long term. So I'm, uh, I, that's why I obviously am focused. On the question of what comes next, um, you know, obviously there's gonna be lots of opportunities to what comes next. Personally, I focus on what we have today. I'm in the White House and the State Department focus on, quote, next countries. And hopefully there'll be many, many more to come. But I think it's imperative for all of us uh, not to lose sight of what we already have and make those solid and before we chase uh, the next one. But I think ultimately uh, we'll be doing that as well um, simultaneously. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nides. And uh, to you, Ambassador Mohammed El Raja. We are celebrating one year of the Abraham Accords, as we all know. What can we now say about Israel's relations with the United Arab Emirates? How do you see that? And the second question is, what is the direct economic impact of the agreements now and in the future? Well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for inviting me for this uh, very special event and being uh, with some, uh, such a distinguished group of speakers, uh, Ambassador Knights, Ambassador Danon, uh, my dear friend, uh, Adiv Baruch, and uh, Ayelet Verben. Uh, unfortunately, due to logistics uh, situation, we couldn't uh, be, make it there physically, but I'm sure there'll be many other opportunities in the future. Um, please allow me to start by thanking the U.S. efforts and uh, complementing what uh, Ambassador Knight just mentioned. Uh, really, the U.S. had played uh, the leadership role and been very supportive uh, in this uh, peace process and, uh, of course, remain committed to the regional uh, peace and uh, prosperity of the people in the Middle East. So we are really thankful for that. And to answer your question, um, on what I can say about the relations between Israel and, and the UAE, um, allow me to start by saying that uh, I first came to Israel about a year ago. And looking over the progress that we have made, I can happily say that we have set the foundation for a strong and long-lasting relationship. Uh, while government bodies and the leadership of both countries have critical roles, still, at this early stage, I ultimately see people-to-people -people ties and cultural exchanges as a central tenant for our mutual success and for the success of the region as a whole, as we all strive together to achieve a more inclusive, tolerant, and pragmatic Middle East. The close and uh, productive ties between the UAE and Israel have already begun to benefit other regional allies. Uh, I call it collateral uh, benefits. Uh, I believe if we act intelligently, there are other projects and opportunities for regional cooperation which can uh, provide major economic benefits for the good of the broader region, with the potential to lift the economic status of millions of families across this region, of course. Um, these opportunities, uh, of course, would require coordination and support from both the public sector and the private sectors here in Israel and in neighboring countries. But I believe there is enough pragmatism among the participants in this forum and among the leadership in the region to build a strong and lasting commercial and industrial project, which will then employ and provide and improve the standard of living and uh, better prospects in that for generations. Uh, <laughs> um, 
on what, what are the direct economic uh, impacts of this agreement. Um, to put it in U.S. dollar terms, between August 2020 and November 2021, uh, the total val volume of non-petroleum trade between the UAE and Israel amounted to nearly $1.3 billion. Uh, this, is, uh, is, this is a strong starting point. However, we are optimistic that if both countries put their best efforts into establishing uh, the necessary framework, uh, such as uh, finalizing, finalizing the FTA, opening projects in both countries to new international players, we can drive that number up uh, tenfold. Um, so uh, we have uh, over 100 MOUs that were signed uh, during the process, during the, the past one year, and uh, these can become, these MOUs can become active business partnerships and cooperation will increase between companies and across all industries in the UAE and Israel. So across sectors, we envision that uh, productivity and innovation can flourish and thus increase, increase the level of trade and economic progress. Um, I can say that we see increased trade leading, uh, increasing uh, trade uh, leading to growth and in new employment opportunities in both countries. Uh, especially if we're talking about uh, new job creation, uh, I mean, future jobs, if I may call it so. Thank you, Ambassador Raja. I have to say I was part of a delegation called Beyond Business 2, delegation with many of the participants here, Dr. Tomery, you guys, and I think it was very, very moving and exciting to be part of this uh, delegation. It really felt like we are all uh, making history together. And it was very, very moving and uh, not, not, not being cynical, we really felt like we were doing history together. So thank you again. Uh, Ambassador Eric Danon, a question to you now is, uh, how do you see the Israel's participation in the European Green Deal, please? We can hear you, Ambassador. Are you muted? Okay. Can you okay, hear me now? Okay. It's okay? Yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Th thank you very much for your uh, invitation. It's an honor for me to, 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 to be here. And um, let's say, first, remind what is the European Green Deal. It's a new growth strategy, I should say, that aims at transforming the EU into modern, uh, resource-efficient and more competitive economy. And the French presidency uh, is going to work on this nouveau modèle européen of uh, growth, la croissance. And like Israel, we aim at zero emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050. Like COVID, climate change and environmental degradation are global challenges that require a global response and Europe's share of the global response is the European Green Deal. Now, I see at least three areas in which there could be a collaboration with Israel. First, research and development. The European Green Deal will not bear fruits if it does not mobilize research and development for new technologies, sustainable solutions, and disruptive innovation. You know, at least 35% of the budget of Horizon Europe, the European Research Program, will fund new solutions for climate. And Israel is part of Horizon Europe and signed for it in early December, last December. So that's the first part of it, research and development. Now, if we want to accelerate the transition to a cleaner economy, we need digital technologies, artificial intelligence, 5G, uh, cloud and edge computing. So some of these areas are areas of excellence for Israel, and it opens great perspectives for a fruitful collaboration. Um, I should say maybe, uh, what comes uh, with uh, the solar energy, the management of the solar energy and of the smart grids is very interesting um, in this field. And then maybe I should add the transport. 
which accounts for a quarter of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. If we Israeli and Europeans want to achieve climate neutrality, a 90% reduction in transport emissions is needed by 2050. So cleaner alternatives to the current mobility habits will have to be offered everywhere here and in Europe. And here it's very important because of, you know, everybody knows things about the traffic here in Israel. So in France, we have the experience in the management of multimodal transport, and we have a competitive technology. So smart traffic management systems can be a good blend of European expertise and equipments with Israeli digital and cyber technology. And if you want to reduce congestion and pollution in Paris or Tel Aviv, I just say, we need to be smart. And I think we shall be smarter together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Knights. I think that uh, Prime Minister Bennett took a very, really, really uh, serious stand uh, in our, our own, in Israel's emissions, and uh, uh, we will see the impact of his declaration in the next few years. Another question is for uh, um, Ambassador Knights. What kind of new and other uh, business opportunities have opened in the Israel-US relations? Well, I have been looking at these. What, what business opportunities in Israel and um, the US? We're talking about new opportunities that have opened business Israel-US relations. Listen, I, the good news is there is no lack of opportunity between Israel and the United States. You know, uh, we're the long, largest single trading partner, $50 billion of trade. Uh, it's everything from technology to energy to, um, to science um, to education um, to card goods. Um, this relationship, as uh, Joe Biden has said, is unbreakable on every level on national security, economics, emotional, the emotional attachment from, the, from Joe Biden and the, and the United States of America, both Democrats and Republicans, is not a partisan issue, is an emotional connection to the state of Israel. I, I've had the honor since I've been here to spend an enormous amount of time uh, with uh, Prime Minister Bennett and Foreign Minister Lapid uh, and basically the whole cabinet. And first of all, I, I wanna congratulate um, uh, the prime minister and the foreign minister for putting this coalition together. It is, to me, uh, beyond anyone's comprehension of what could be done when you really try. I mean, you have a you have a coalition of uh, from from Bennett uh, uh, to uh, minister uh, uh, to to Minister Shaket to Mansour Abbas and everything in between. It's it's remarkable. And, and that bond of this kind of a coalition working with the United States is unbreakable. So I, the, the, the reality of this is the, the relationship is just um, quite remarkable. Um, and I, listen, I see it here because listen, I, every, you know, every business person, you know, every startup, every private equity firm, uh, every company has operations here. I mean, the only good thing of COVID, and there's nothing really good about COVID, the only good thing about COVID, I haven't had to do visitors every day. There's a list of February is remarkable. I mean, I can't tell you about every single CEO, big company, small company, private equity, technology. And then of course, you know, all my Jewish friends who represent every Jewish organization in the world want to come here. So I just, I do not worry about opportunities. I, I just worry about making sure we, we work closely together and get the benefit for everybody. And, I, and I've said this a million times. Um, one of the best, the Abraham Accords, clearly has been the, the, the relationship between uh, the GCC country bilateral with Israel and the United States. I want to make sure some of that benefit also gets to the Palestinian people. Um, so I'm hoping to work on programs that help making sure that the Palestinian people see the benefit of the Abraham Accords can only enhance uh, this notion that we have we in the United States are promoting is an idea of obviously the vision of a two-state solution. But again, not to get political, it's just how I think about economic benefits to people. This is not about governments. It's just men and women, kids, and how they can benefit from the Abraham Accords and these bilateral relationships. That's what I get excited about. And I think that's what we all 
uh, and our, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is to benefit everyone to make not only Israel uh, a safer uh, democratic Jewish state, but the economic benefits of the Abraham Accords and what we're doing uh, goes down to everyone who lives uh, in this region. So um, that's how I think about the, the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Knight. Same question to uh, Ambassador Danone about uh, new Israeli-European uh, cooperation. What is your point of view? Well, the, the EU and Israel are bound by what we call an association agreement, which is one of the oldest trade agreements, uh, if not the oldest signed by the EU. It was concluded in 1995. Uh, so since then, we have deepened our relations with, um, for instance, the Open Sky Agreement. It was uh, three years ago. And more recently, with the participation of Israel to Horizon <coughs> Europe, I just uh, said something about, about it, as it is our research and innovation program. Um, so there are many other areas open for cooperation with Israel. What is important maybe is, I could call that standards and norms. Um, because the Israeli government has shown interest in getting closer to EU standards, for instance, in food and agriculture. Uh, other fields, of course, can be investigated, transport, particularly rail transport, financial regulation, etc. And I think really that in any case, it will be a win-win cooperation. Um, Let's not forget also that the bulk of Israeli-European cooperation is not done at central level by the uh, European Union. It is done through each of the 27 member states. Uh, so all cultural and consular relations are handled exclusively by member states. So history, terrorism, family ties, people-to-people -people relations are very dense between Israel and Europe, of course, particularly between uh, France and Israel, we have the uh, largest Jewish community in Europe with about 500,000 uh, Jewish uh, citizens in, in, in France. So um, new opportunities uh, are on the various fields, but I should mention first the, uh, the norms and standards the research and development, as I said earlier, and um, every kind of path that can be uh, improved. Uh, it is, of course, difficult to imagine with the COVID right now, but as this crisis will be over, you will see probably that, uh, uh, you know, the European Union is the first uh, trade partner with Israel, uh, uh, one third of the imports of Israel, they come from the European Union countries. It's about $20 billion. And, and uh, so the third trading partner, we have many opportunities, and I'm sure that in the coming years, it will be better and better. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now to you, uh, Ayelet uh, Nachmias Verben. First of all, congratulations for your nomination, your nomination as the new chairperson of the Israel Expert Institute. Yes. Congratulations. I have two questions for you. The first one is what will be some of the Israel's expert institutions' priorities for next year, for this current year? And how can the Israel Expert Institute further the economic relationship with UAE, US, and the European Union in general? Thank you, Abraham. As a board member in the Israeli Export Institute, it's a good opportunity to be with you and with Adiv, and obviously with the honorable ambassadors, uh, unfortunately not with us today, so thank you. Um, um, it, it is very, very interesting because before I'm moving to, to our priorities at the, at the Institute, I think we need to say some, something that is very clear. Unfortunately, Dr. Ron Malka, I think, had to go, but it is very important to understand that Israeli industry in spite of the results of 2021 of the export, which were obviously fantastic, the export is going through a very, very chaotic time in Israel. 
it's not just the currency, which, you know, it, it, usually it would say that, you know, the situation, the economic situation in Israel is very, very good. But I have my good friend here, Marian Cohen, who is uh, uh, the head of the high-tech division in the, in the MAI, and he would tell you it's not just the industries that I come from, which is the more mature industries, you know, plastics, irrigation, etc. But it's also chaotic even in the U.S., even in the UAE, and in Europe as well, because they also see the supply chains going berserk, and this is something that we can't really, we know that there is no one thing that we can depend on. And that is very, very trying. We don't know exactly when we're going to see the results, and we hope that we won't see the results. We also need to know that these fantastic unicorns that we have, that is a small part of the, uh, uh, of the economy in the sense that not many employees are part of these fantastic unicorns. So what we need to do is actually, and this is part of my priorities, we need to make sure that we advance high tech. It doesn't really, well, I mean, it does, by the way, it needs the Export Institute, which is quite amazing, Adiv, because it's fantastic to see, you know, sometimes we have our partners in the Ministry of Economy, in the Foreign uh, uh, Trade Division, and it's amazing to see that the high tech very much relies on the Export Institute on the one hand, but we also need to make sure that we push forward very, very strongly and firmly mature industries as well. As I think I said uh, uh, with my friend, Dr. Ron Tomer, we said one of these days uh, uh, in a meeting, and I said, you know, I don't really think there is food tech without the traditional food industries, okay? And that is very, very important to remember, not just because of food security and energy security, which is all of the things, you know, that are very, very important for us as industrialists, uh, you know, for us as Zionists, uh, uh, people who live in Israel. So. Uh, going to the priorities that I see for 2022, there are new and exciting uh, 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 fields that the institute is going to be entering. There's not, it's, it's amazing to see, by the way, there's not just high tech going out of Israel and mature industries going out of Israel being exported to the UAE, United States, and, uh, and Europe but also social export is amazing. We already have uh, uh, digital health and we have education, uh, uh, remote education uh, technologies. And it's amazing to see there is so much we can do in that field. Also, there are new territories. And, and I think one of the most exciting thing about the Abraham Accords is the fact that we, when we, uh, and I felt the same way, as you said, when we came to the, to the UAE, uh, to the Emirates, I think, the joint ventures that we can create together are so much stronger than anything, you know, just putting it at export and import. That is, that, you know, the, the potential there um, for, you know, companies in Israel is just by the mere fact that they're a huge gateway to the world. And from my perspective, these are the things that we are going to be pushing forward. I, I think this is also a good opportunity to thank Adiv for a very, very uh, trying tenor, especially in the past two years of, uh, you know, ever since COVID started off. Um, I think we're gonna be, one of the things, you know, and I, I'll probably wrap up with this, this part at least, we're gonna have major growth engines within the Export Institute. You're gonna be a part of it, I'm glad to say. So we are gonna make sure that export prevails, passes this chaotic times, and becomes, you know, becomes much stronger, which is, you know, we keep saying stronger when you had such a, you know, such a huge number of, uh, of, 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 of goods being exported from Israel and services as well. There is still so much that we can do. And this is what I aspire to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayelet. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Ativ Baruch. And uh, the questions to you before the buzzer surprise us is uh, how has the You're Israeli sorry. economy <laughs> how has the Israeli economy managed to navigate through the pandemic and what are the main benefits from the Abraham Accords? Well, since uh, time is up, so we can say thank you. It was really nice to meet you and great. Oh, we have great to be here. <laughs> we have three extra minutes. So <laughs> That's great. somebody so, was kind enough. Anyway, I would like to take the opportunity, first of all, and with the distinguished ambassador that we have here, is to really welcome Ayelet to take the challenge, and I think it's the most important mission in the Israeli economy. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much we'll invest in CapEx and innovation. If we don't reach out the market and sell the innovations, nothing will happen. And that's why I've spoken to Ron Malka for years. 
And when he was ambassador, and we have to change the paradigm shift that it doesn't take just R&D investment. And you know, Aviram, how much we invest in our companies between R&D and sales, marketing, and business development. And we have to change the whole equation. Because we have a market of about 10 million people. The innovation that we have, it's too small of a market. We have to reach out. And what we did during the years, starting from the COVID-19, remember I started the mission was in 2017, and I've exceeded the, the maximum time I can serve. But I went through a process where there's no budget, no government, COVID, and EBRA records. So that would be part of the history, right? Now, take in consideration that we had a limit of a budget. We had to do through a digital transformation in no time under the theme of business continuity and global business continuity in order to create the momentum. And the results were that in 2021, Israel had exceeded and over surplus the export to 134 billion, 136, depends how you count it. And it's one of the highest per capita in the world. That means that we had to really organize and work in full synchronicity with our ambassadors, with our economic attaches around the world. I remember running around through all the ambassadors in Israel to wake them up, to create a wake up call. So let's move to the digital space in order to create the momentum and not to stop it. And we tried not to stop it. And part of the thing we always claim at the Israeli Expert Institute that you know, we're always dealing with the good news. We're not here to cry. We're not here to say what are the problems, but we have to drive solutions to the market. And that's why the news, the news are always looking for bad news. But the good news are that we have created a platform that is helping every Israeli business to reach the global markets. And the global markets are a necessity. I would like and I would really like to, uh, to embed this, uh, this idea because looking at the UAE, the UAE and the opportunity that we have with Abraham Accord is to change the whole region. It's not just about bilateral trade between Israel and the UAE. You know, the government, our leaders have showed the direction. But the one who will pave the road are the private sectors and the business that will continue expanding the road and to create real business out of it. And to create it both scalable and sustainable because we're over administrations, over ambassadors, because they will change. But the businesses have to last and to continue working. And that is the opportunity. The opportunity now to be exposed to about 3.5 to 4 billion new individuals in the world that have not been exposed to the usual products, innovation, solutions. And that's where the opportunity is. And we all have to take it seriously and understand that it's a long-term play, it's not a short-term play. And therefore, I took a personal commitment, and Ambassador Hajan knows it. I took a personal commitment to be a role model, how businesses should be done in order to create it. As for our generation, we received the cho to change the whole neighborhood. I hope I yell it and, uh, and, and the team will continue doing it because it's so important for our future. Thank you very much. These are exciting times. Thank you very much, Ayele. Thank you very much, Adiv. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nides, Danone, and Ambassador El Raja. And thank you for your time. תודה רבה, עדי ואיילת, אני אשמח אם תישארו איתנו בבקשה, אני אשמחה להזמין שוב לבמה את דוקטור רון תומר, נשיא התאחדות התעשיינים, לנצל את הרגע הזה, במיוחד בשבילך עדיו, שבי שבי איילת. עדיו ברוך עמד בראש החץ של היצוא הישראלי בארבע השנים האחרונות, והיו שנים מאוד מאוד מאתגרות ליצוא הישראלי, שהצליח לצאת אפילו מחוזק מהקורונה לפי הנתונים שאנחנו שמענו היום. עדיו הצליח לנווט את ספינת היצוא בבטחה בתוך שנים מטלטלות ובשם כולנו רצינו להודות לך, יושב ראש מכון היצוא היוצא, עדיב ברוך, ולאחל לך המון בהצלחה, איילת נחמיאס ורבין, יושבת הראש החדשה. אז אני רק, אני רק אגיד מילה נוגה. כן. אנחנו באמת פה בתקופה היסטורית וגם ברגעים היסטוריים. לעדיב אמרנו, איתרע מזלו 
והקורונה תפסה שנתיים מהת... מהתפקיד שלו, שבאמת עצרה קצת את מכון הייצוא והייתה צריכה לעשות, כמו שעדיף אמר, שיפטינג שלם לחשיבה, תערוכות, משלחות, פתאום הדבר הזה הפך להיות בעייתי. התמזל מזלו שהסכמי אברהם נחתמו, ואני חייב להגיד שעדי ומי שליוויתי אותו במשלחות שהיו, בהחלט עשה את זה בצורה אה, טובה ונחושה. ואולי אני חושב שאפשר לקרוא לו עוד מעט שייח' אדיב, לאור הקשרים שהוא יצר שם באמירויות, ובאמת תוביל בדבר הזה, ותזכרו, אדיב אמר לא הייתה ממשלה, לא הייתה ממשלה, זה אומר שגם לא היו משלחות ממשלתיות, ובעצם אנחנו כסקטור העסקי, אדיב, אני, הילד כסגניתי, באמת עשינו והובלנו שם לא מעט דברים, ואני חושב, אדיב, על זה באמת מגיעה לך הערכה ואת הפיסה שלך בהיסטוריה עשית. ולפני שאני לך את השי, אני גם רוצה לברך את חברתי, שותפתי איילת ורבי נחמיאס. לא רק האישה הראשונה בראש מכון הייצוא, אלא גם באמת כוח טורבו שבא עכשיו, ואני מקווה שביציאה מהקורונה, אם יש כזה דבר יציאה מהקורונה, תדע לבוא ולהחזיר את המכון למה שהיה טרום הקורונה, בסיטואציה שבה בעצם כבר שכחנו מה זה משלחות, ושכחנו מה זה לעשות. ואני בטוח שאת האישה הנכונה במקום הנכון, והעצוא הישראלי סומך עלייך שתעשי הרבה טוב. אז כיוון שנותנים בדרך כלל פרסים רק למי שהולך ולא למי שבא, אז עדיף יקירי. ואני בטוח שעדיף יהיה איתנו ונדע ביכולות שלו להשתמש גם בעתיד. תוריד רגע את המסכה האלה, שנעשה תמונה אחת. קצת ממרחק, שלא יגידו שאנחנו... נעשה ככה, יאללה. עדיף, כן, בבקשה. ממש קצר, לא לעכב פה אף אחד ולא להחזיק, אבל אני חייב פשוט להגיד תודה. תודה בראש ובראשונה לרובי, אתה יודע, לפני רון ובכל הקדנציה שלקחתי על עצמי, ולומר לכולם פה שלא היינו מצליחים לפעול, לעבוד, לקדם עם כל, את כל האתגרים שעמדו בפנינו, אם לא היינו עובדים בשיתוף פעולה מלא, הדוק, בתמיכה מלאה, וגם כשרון נכנס לתפקיד, עם הבנה ותודעה עמוקה לחשיבות הייצוא הישראלי. ופה אני קורא לכל אחד ואחת מהתעשיינים, כי גם אני תעשיין מעולם התוכנה, להבין שהשוק הישראלי הוא בתקרת זכוכית, ואחוז היצואנים מתוך התעשיינים הוא עדיין נמוך. אני חושב שיש פה איזשהו תהליך שאנחנו צריכים לעבור ביחד, להגדיל את התודעה בנושא הייצור, לעבוד ביחד, כי פשוט אין לנו ברירה. ויש לנו מה למכור לעולם של קרוב לשמונה מיליארד איש. לא שוק של עשרה מיליון איש, שוק של שמונה מיליארד איש, וכל אחת ואחד צריכים לקחת את זה באופן מאוד אחראי, ואנחנו תמיד נהיה פה לשרת אתכם, גם כשאני בחוץ, אני עדיין בפנים. אז שיהיה לכולנו בהצלחה ותודה, תודה לכולם. תודה רבה על ההשתתפות שלכם ביום הראשון של הוועידה. אנחנו סיימנו להיום, שיהיה לכם בתיאבון ברוך התרב ונתראה מחר בבוקר. יש לכם גם הופעה בערב, תהנו קולם של תמיר גרינברג.